Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 55. Now, this episode is uh, with my friend Josh Russell. Uh, Josh is awesome. We, uh, we talk about all kinds of stuff. We actually met on the set of a new Star Wars fan film called Scoundrels. We worked together as a, uh, opposing forces, one, uh, one might say. Um, but in this episode, we talk about uh, Josh was in the military for 12 years. So right off the bat, thank you for your service, Josh. Uh, but we talk about that. We talk about where he was from, how he grew up, and then we get into uh, when he started acting. And it's been a really cool journey for him to hear the the road that life took him uh, from jumping out of pretty much everything with a parachute to, you know, taking great acting classes that he talks about. And uh, he gives me some free info, which is uh, kind of the ulterior motive. I'm just getting great acting tips from people now. But... Uh, uh, this was a great talk. It was super fun. Um, you guys are going to love Josh. Check him out online. Also check out Scoundrels, uh, the Star Wars fan film, at youtube.com slash bigcitysendout. That'll be out May 4th. Um, I hope you guys like it. So until then, you know, without further ado, here's the interesting podcast, episode number 55, which is significant, you will hear, with Josh Russell. Theme song time. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So right, so right off the bat, I just take control. That's right. Welcome, <laughs> welcome everybody to Brian Balance's most interesting podcast. I'm your host, Josh Russell, <laughs> and today I will be interviewing my first guest, Brian Balance. That's right. Best of luck to you, my friend. <laughs> That's why I have a show, is so I don't have to talk about myself at all. <laughs> Great. So, yeah, how uh, you been, man? I've been good. How about you? I've been good. I've been good. You've been staying busy? I have been... I have been both busy and not busy. It's kind of a weird, um, sort of a weird, uh, stuck in the middle quandary that I'm in. But um, I've been, I've, got, I've been getting a lot of stuff done film wise. Cool. Um, I've been working on, uh, been working on trying to get my own business running, and I'm having, uh, I'm running into some headaches with the government. Of course. And um, and that stuff like that. And then other than that, I'm just being sort of a. Um, sort of just being a retired army guy that sits around the house and does whatever he wants, I guess. There you go. That, that's the dream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do what I want. It's, a, it's hard to do though, because I am, I have always been a very goal oriented and must have something to do and get done kind of individual. Of course. Um, I, I am sure we'll talk about all of this in more depth, but mm -hmm. it's, it's an adjustment for me to, kind of go from being that military guy who was always you know every morning you woke up you had a you had something you had to get done and for a long time I just kind of I put a lot of the creative stuff just off to the back and it wasn't even on the stove much less, less on the back burner it's like I had it put away somewhere in the basement oh yeah um you know so now you get into the you get you get out of that regimented aspect of life that you live when you're in the military and, and becoming a civilian and you know things aren't spelled out for you quite as much yeah and so now now you're trying to you know trying to figure out a way to fit in sometimes is a challenge for me but anyway sure so that's very well, common i've talked to a I'm, lot of vets that that say the, the same thing i talked to a guy one time who was in the he's in the like portuguese air force he was from portugal for like 35 years and he always said the hardest adjustment was the loss of mission when you get out. When you're like, oh, I, I have freedom? Huh. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's hard to process that the, the new mission is you. Right. You know, like you need to have – you spent you spent a majority of your youth, um, or in, in, in my case, I did. You know, I didn't – I wasn't in the military for a full 20 years. I was in for 12 years and retired medically because I got injured. Sure. Um. 
the um, you know, but then I continued to work as a civilian in sort of a contracting role, which kept me very close to the military. So, Mm -hmm. you know, and you and you still kind of have that mentality of of go out and accomplish the mission every day. My mission today is to serve the guys that are still serving, and you keep you keep going at it that way. And then you know, eventually, like like the difference is, and I don't mean this is all this isn't meant to be any kind of selfish thing, but course Re- really a heart one of the things that it's th- that you have to realize is like you, you know you got to make the mission has to be your own success yeah oh yeah because, because the army covers everything for you you know you've got you, you've got your housing paid for well, they'll feed you they'll give you everything you need to get by day to day your mission is to go out and accomplish the mission that they give you right and um and then you, you get to the civilian world and you no longer have those you know, you, you don't have that anymore. And, you know, the mundane things, going to the grocery store and stuff like that's fine. It's not a big, it's not an issue. But, right. um, but finding purpose to drive, to, finding something with purpose to keep your motivation going, it can be challenging. I tell you, it, it really can be. There's moments where sometimes um, <laughs> you just, just kind of sit down and t- take a look at yourself or whatever, or take, take like an evaluation of where you are and you just go, what am I doing? I feel almost anxious. <laughs> It's like it's like an anxiety. It's like, man, I, I, I like, what am I supposed to be? I, there's something I'm supposed to be doing right now, and I'm not doing it, and it's going to cost me big time. Sure, you know, I, that's the way, way it feels sometimes. So I hear you. I, we have a, I have a ton of military members in my family. Like my dad fought in Vietnam. My older and oh. my younger brother are both in the army. My grandfather's in World War II. I got uncles and cousins, all service members. So that's, I hear you. I hear. You. I've heard these stories. Where, where, where are you? Where are you from? You're not from Tampa, are you? I am not originally from Tampa or Florida, either one. I grew up in, I grew up, I, I kind of moved all over the place. Um, mm-hmm. I was born in Texas. What? And then, yeah, I was born in Fort Worth, Texas. Okay. And then I grew up, half of my childhood was spent in this amazing town. This place is so cool. It's like, um, when I watch shows like Stranger Things, which I think is very similar to E.T. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, those two shows, like the way they portray that town, that's the way my town was in the first half of my childhood where I grew up. It was a place in Utah called Moab, Moab, Moab Utah. And it's a pretty famous town, actually. Um, there is a lot of mountain biking that goes on there. It's a big tourist draw these days. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Canyonlands National Park is close to there. Arches National Monument is there just outside of town. The Colorado River runs through there, so there's a lot of uh, river rafting. A lot of the outdoors type stuff. It's in the southwest. Down, it's near the Four Corners area of Utah. That's Absolutely awesome. beautiful town. Yeah, I, I grew up there, and um, and was that really was defining so much of my early childhood. Just r- riding bikes anywhere I want to. I mean, you know, I was 11 years old, and I could take off on my bike and just go anywhere I want, anywhere in town. Um, you know, I would go around the corner and go to the swimming pool. And during the summertime, I lived at the at the public swimming pool. Um, you know, it's just this awesome experience. And then my parents picked us up and we moved to <laughs> New Mexico. <laughs> oh, very different. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, in, in some way that they're very close to each other. They actually border each other. But mm-hmm. but yes, in a lot of ways, very different. And the town that we moved to was a little town way out on the east side of Albuquerque called Moriarty. Oh. And uh, literally, when I moved there, it had no stoplights. You hear, you hear the, uh, you hear the saying, "It's a one stoplight town." Well, this town was a no stoplight town, <laughs> and um, middle of nowhere, and, and um, you know, it was a huge adjustment. So, so anyway, I grew up in Utah, and then in New Mexico. Those were the two places where, where I grew up, and I went to college out there, and then eventually joined the military, and that's what moved me. That's what got me out to the East Coast. So I just kind of got sent out here by Uncle Sam, and then trapped, and have been here ever since. <laughs> gotcha. Got it. another common story. <laughs> it happens. Yeah. What what uh what got you? What what made you want to enlist? Oh man, that is that's a crazy question. Um, thank you. <laughs> I was uh well, it's more, probably more crazy answer than it is crazy question. But since we're talking about me today, I guess we can go full force with it. Yes. Um, I was in college, and in college, I was studying business administration. I was a football player. I played college football, mm-hmm. and uh, on a scholarship, and then. I was. I took a class, an international relations class, because I really. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I even though I had, by the time I was in college, I figured out how to get good grades, but I was never really an academic. I. I just sure. never. You know, I was. I was doing it because it got me on the football field. Right. Right. <laughs> I, I majored in football. There you go. College, <laughs> um. Look, I got out of it with a with a degree in business administration. But um. Anyway, there so I go. was in the. I was in this uh, international relations class, and we started talking about a lot of. Uh, stuff that just kind of 
it just interested me in terms of politics and geopolitics and stuff. Sure. Um, I was smart enough to not get a poli sci degree. If I had probably gone with all of my gut instincts, um, I would not, I would have gone somewhere and gone to an arts program probably to be mm-hmm. honest with you, but then I would have been shamed and, and, <laughs> and excommunicated from the family. So if I'd have gone to political science, that might've, kept my interest a little bit more. But anyway, I didn't want to major in poli sci because I was just like, oh, that's, worth, that's a waste of time. Mm-hmm. So, um, but I took this class, international relations, and it got me very interested in some things. And I started doing some reading on my own just because I was always in a fight with the teacher that I'd like, I, I did not have the same viewpoints as the instructor. Sure. And, uh, and so we were always, I was always going back and forth with this guy. And, um, and so I read some books and uh, one of the books that I read was a book about John F. Kennedy called Camelot. And the story uh, that's told in there fascinated me, and it made me think that maybe what I wanted to do, if and when I got out of college, and maybe if I don't play in the NFL, right, which uh-huh. obviously didn't happen. Of course. God. And um, <laughs> so, so uh, was maybe I maybe I could join the military and get some experience, and then move, you know, m- you know, get some experience in the military, and then maybe have a career like in in one of the federal agencies, like the FBI or the CIA or something like that. Yeah. And so I started talking to an army recruiter, and he started kind of showing me the, showing me what what they had to offer, and you know, having a college degree um, makes you a, a big catch for an army recruiter. Yeah. So uh, they they do everything they can to try to hook you and. Um, you know, the, the thing is I didn't have anybody, no, no one in my family had ever really served in the military. My dad did some time in the national guard back in the early to mid Mm seventies, but it wasn't, you know, he, he, it wasn't, he, he wasn't involved in the military in a way where he could have sat me down and said, Hey, this is what, this is what's going on. This is what they're telling you. Um, so I was really kind of going in blind and, um, I was convinced that I wanted to be a, be in military intelligence is what I was convinced I wanted to do because it sounded smart and big and cool. Right. And, um, the recruiter kept talking to me saying, I think that you might want to think about being in the infantry. <laughs> and here's the thing. <laughs> big guy, <laughs> football player. <laughs> well, you know, here's, here, here's the stereotypical r- response that you would get from anyone in my life at that time. They would say, Oh, you're talking to the army. They'll always try to get you to be the infantry, <laughs> whatever that, whatever you do, don't sign up for the infantry because they always try to get you to do that. And then, and, the, and it's like, they're trying to pull a bait and switch on you. Like they're, they're trying, they're going to talk you into ruining your own life, you know? Right. And, uh, and his, but his take on it from the very beginning of it was, look, he's like, if you think for one second that what you want to do is special forces, you should probably go into the infantry. Uh, and, he, and he said special forces. And I, the first thing I thought of was, was Rambo. Right. Because right. I had, I had no idea. I had no clue what special forces was. I, and I thought green berets were fake. I didn't even think that was a real <laughs> thing. He starts telling me about special forces, and I'm like, you mean like the movie Rambo? That's not real. You know, I was an idiot. Man. Right. I was tell- I'm telling you. I, I, th- I thought I had it all figured out, and I knew what I was going to do, and it was going to be this cool thing. And this guy was trying to help me, and I was like, no. And I was just telling no, no, no. Yeah, anyway, I was an idiot. And so uh, I, went out to the, I went out to the combines and, and failed at that. I didn't get drafted or, or I didn't get onto a free agent. As a, I was a free agent in the NFL for about two seconds, and I never got onto a tryout or anything like that. So right. I decided, yeah, I, I think I'm going to be done with this. I'm not going to chase a pipe dream. Um, and I, look, I got off the plane from Los Angeles after being cut from a tryout. And uh, um. I, I called the recruiter up and I was like, Hey man, let's, I think it's time to do this. And so he, he came down from Santa Fe and met me in at my apartment in Albuquerque. And, uh, I ended up signing the paperwork and I was gone inside of a week, man. It was like, yeah. as soon as I signed that paperwork, all right, be at this place at six o'clock in the morning or the police will come find you. That's like, about what? right. <laughs> so, and, the, and then it began. That's when it all really began. That's, that's so, the, the quickest route. That's a, my younger brothers in the, in, in the infantry. And that was his thing. It's like the quickest route out. You do infantry. You're you're on the next bus. And here's it, well, here's the thing. It, well, it doesn't really matter which bus you which. But well, I guess delayed entry program. Sure, like it might have been. They might have been like you got to wait 45 days or something like that. Yep. But it, it happened pretty quick for me. I remember it was like, okay, here's your date. It may have been two weeks that I had to show up. Sure. But um, but the thing is, is what what's it's interesting is once I got into the military, um. I spent two years at language school, and then I spent six months at AIT. And by the time I was done with AIT, I had had enough. I, I was <laughs> like, "This was, 
like the probably from I'm not saying about anybody else. We're talking about about this for me. Of course. For me personally, it was probably not the best thing for me to sign up to do. Right. Um, my personality and my attitude was definitely not geared towards your typical type of military intelligence guy. Um, I don't say. know. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think that it was a hundred percent geared towards the military at all. Now looking back on it, mm-hmm. but um, you know, you can, you can overcome that if things if things working out for you in a really good way, you know. But go through two years of struggling with foreign language and putting up with with a lot of the shenanigans, mm-hmm. and it, you know, and your 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 perspective on things can can change quite dramatically. Whereas, you know, as soon as soon as I had an opportunity to go to airborne school, I went straight to airborne school. And um, nothing, nothing was going to, to stop me from going to airborne school. Um, and then I went to the 82nd Airborne Division. And I was, so, I was so ecstatic that I got to go to the 82nd Airborne Division because I knew that I wouldn't be stuck in a cubicle. And I knew that I wouldn't be like – I wouldn't have to wear class A dress uniforms to work on Tuesday morning just because people want to and stuff like that. Sure. You know, it, it was more of a tactical environment where I was going to be able to be outside. I would go to the range. I would be able to shoot – weapons and stuff like that and then as my career started to, to pick up I, I went immediately to iraq um I, I got off the bus at the 82nd airborne division and um i should have bus i didn't ride a bus there I, someone dropped <laughs> my house but you, you know dropped I mean? out of a I, helicopter I, I, I got yeah they, they they basically put me on a, a they put me on a 747 and flew to north carolina and when we were over fort bragg they just pushed me out there you go <laughs> welcome and, to the um, airborne division <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They didn't even give me a real parachute. They just gave me a reserve chute, and I had to like, <laughs> I had to actually put it on while I was falling. Of course, <laughs> get it on. And somehow I did. And when I pulled the reserve handle, that the parachute worked, and yeah. and I landed. I landed right outside the company headquarters. Yeah, two people's chutes didn't open, and that's how they call you guys. <laughs> well, that's how I got my job. Exactly. Yeah. Like, I guess you got the job, buddy. <laughs> So, uh, that's right. and your first job is clean, clean that mess up right there. That's right. Here's your toothbrush. Get to Get working. those bodies <laughs> off the Sergeant Major's lawn. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, any, anyway, I got to the 82nd Airborne and within two months I was in Kuwait and we, and we were, you know, we were in Kuwait and then obviously that led to the invasion of Iraq. So I, I had no time off once we hit, once I got there, that, that was it. Sure. Um, and I, you know, so I, I was with, I was with some great dudes at the 82nd Airborne division. I thought they were fantastic guys. Um, I, I, the guys that I was, I ended up on a team of four guys that, uh, that, like we stormed Baghdad all by ourselves, basically. Um, and, and, and actually in in all sarcasm aside, the four of us actually did, um, in a weird kind of way, storm into Fallujah all by ourselves with no backup and no support. They didn't even, nobody even knew where we were. And the four of us were driving around in Fallujah in, uh, in an unarmored, non-armored Humvee. Four military intelligence dorks, <laughs> and uh, I don't know how we survived. I don't know how we lived, how we got out of that place. After, after it was this was before it became such a hotbed. But it was the truth is is it was always the most dangerous place in, in Iraq. It just hadn't become as famous for it yet. Sure. And um and we but anyway we got out of it. Blah blah blah. And so the point is is we started uh, as my. As my time in the military advanced, I actually ended up in special forces. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> so, if I had just listened to my recruiter in the first place, I think there's there's a possibility my life would have been a little bit more. It would have been harder in the physical sense, but it may have been a little bit easier in the emotional, mental sense. It would have been a lot less of a mental struggle because, as, as I'm sure we'll get into, I went to Arabic school in California and I had to learn how to speak Arabic, and that turned out to be such an incredible challenge for me and by challenge i mean it was an absolutely horrible experience <laughs> was it really so, why oh my god because, it because it's so well, hard it's because it's hard because the arabic language is it's a beautiful language um and it's a beautiful culture there are, there are things about the culture that are absolutely fascinating mm-hmm. um but their their language works like 180 degrees opposite of english Oh, weird. And so you you read it from right to left, you write it from right to left, and many of the many of the I don't know this is hard to explain, but like mm-hmm. the meaning in sentences and stuff, the way they construct sentences with like things like what we know in English as verbs and nouns and adjectives and stuff like that, uh-huh. they don't have they don't necessarily have all that. Basically, every word is, has three letters that are are the root of the word. Oh, weird. And then they they add certain forms 
what they call forms to the three root letters to create the actual words that you're dealing with. Wow. So, and there's like a chart, there's like a, there's like a chart with like 10 or 12 different, uh, verb forms. And then each one of the 12, it's like, it's like a, it's like 12 rows. And then each row has like, I think it's seven or eight columns in it that are the conjugations of each form. So like if it's feminine, it ends with this. If it's, yeah, you know, it's it's bizarre. It's like learning to read Klingon. Sure. The uh, the, the the language um the the la- language does not have vowels. They don't have any vowels in Arabic. They, so every letter is essentially a consonant, and then to create the vowels in Arabic, they use what they call diacriticals, which are these little lines that go above and below certain letters. Mm-hmm. So so like and and I barely even remember what they are now, but like I I know that if the line is underneath a letter. Um, then it makes like the sound like I, like it uh-huh. kind of. If it's above the letter, it makes it sound like a ah or ah, which oh. is which is a. You know what I mean? And, and and so it's 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 just it's completely foreign. It's nothing like English at all. Sure. And um and so not only is the letter system a, a totally foreign concept, um but then the way they construct the sentences themselves and it's, it sounds bad, but basically it's like the the thinking. Because language is really about conveying thoughts and ideas. Right. And what, what you learn with Arabic is that the way that culture portrays thoughts and ideas is just, to me, as a, an, as a, as a white bread American cowboy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm 100%, 100% USA. True. Um, it is such a foreign concept that trying to figure it out is almost like splitting your brain in half. Sure. It's like it, it's like it's like try to it's like trying to you know the trick where you try to rub your chest and pat your head at the same time. <laughs> yes. That that's what it feels like in your brain, except for it's twelve hours a day and and then homework on on in the evenings and on the weekends. It's it's it, it's painful. It's a headache. Literally, it's a headache. Oh man, was that so, was that like a requirement for something, or was that something yeah, you were what, interested in? That's what I signed up for because I'm a big dummy. <laughs> this sounds like a great idea. Let's go. You know, I, I had been in college and had a degree in business administration and accounting. I, my my focus was in accounting. Um, and so, you know, I was, I, I was, and I, and I figured out how to get great, get good grades. And so my confidence was real high and I was like, Hey, all I got to do is read a book and pass the test and I'm smart. Sure. And then, and then I got to Arabic and, and that is not, first of all, the, the, the school that I went to the defense language Institute, it, that's not how it works anyway. Right. That, it just doesn't have that. That's not, that's not the way they do business there. And so I walked into that and thinking that, you know, even, even if it's difficult, if I, you know, I can figure this out, you know, I'm the guy that can put together, uh, I can put together furniture without reading the instructions. If I read the instructions, I'm really good at it, you know? Yeah, for real. <laughs> and, and so, um, but I got there, man, and, and it just, I, it just didn't work. It, it was, it, I literally left humbled and I was, I was glad that I was leaving. I wasn't, you know, I, I was, I, I, I was glad that I got to not go to class anymore sure. kind of thing. But I was I was humbled by it just by the fact I was like, wow, I, you know, I've discovered that there are some there's something that I am not good at. And right. that's what it is. It's definitely I'm not good at understanding, reading or listening or speaking Arabic. Um, now, with that being said, I still passed. I still passed my classes and I still passed my final exam in the end. So I passed and was able to move on and do the job I signed up for. Thank God, because if you don't pass. They like the army's like, well, you weren't good enough to do that, so I guess we'll stick you wherever we need you. Sure. And um, and then there's no telling what you're going to end up doing. So right, I, I passed it, and of course that was motivation to make sure I passed it. I was so I I felt like I was fighting <laughs> for my life to get out there, you know. And, yeah. And I was, but it it was a it was it was a miserable experience, but at the same time it was a humbling experience and a great learning experience. And and, and you know I met a lot of really cool people. Yeah, uh, my instructors. Every every single one of my instru- well, maybe there might be two instructors that I that don't fit this category. But most <laughs> of the instructors that I had were actually very nice and very interesting people, mm-hmm. and I you know learned a lot from it. Learned a lot about the culture and learned a lot of just about other places around the world. You know, I'd never been anywhere else. Um, I'd right. been to Mexico when I was in college to go drink beer in, in Juarez. Maybe that was that was my extent of my foreign travel. So listening to them talk about where they were from was was always very interesting but anyway i I got through it and i got out of it but but um i do love that like you're such a like this is a an audio medium obviously so people don't know just how big of a guy you are so you're like you know i was going to be smart and read these books and like you know do all this computer stuff we're like you you're built like a truck (laughs) so (laughs) you you don't fit the stereotype of like the nerdy kind of guy and i think that's great 
I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, it's interesting. I because I I wasn't quite big enough or fast enough or strong enough or good enough in general to be a professional football player. Sure, sure. <laughs> but I did I didn't quite fit into <laughs> right. whatever whatever other category it was that mentally I was drawn towards this thing and it I don't know. I was all over the place, man. Who it's knows? It's great. People are onions, Josh. They have layers. So That's true. So that is true. You made it to the 82nd Airborne. What things have you jumped out of? Oh man, I I have jumped out of So first of all, Airborne school, you start out jumping out of a, towers and platforms like propelling so right? um like no shoots. you don't repel you just it's, it's not really repelling repelling would be more of like a controlled descent that's really safe oh. <laughs> um jumping jumping off of the tower at airborne school is more like um tying a rope around your nut sack and then like jumping off your roof of and course. hoping hoping that the rope is short enough that you don't slam into the ground yeah. <laughs> um that's kind of more like what they do at airborne school it's a 30 foot tower and you you go the, the inside of the inside of the tower is built like the inside of an airplane fuselage, and then it's tied to a zip line. Basically, it's a big zip line, mm-hmm. um, and you put on a you put on basically what amounts to well, it's basically it's a parachute harness. Um, but the the closest thing to, to anybody who's never parachuted is kind of like a climbing harness, the same kind of climbing harness you would use for rappelling or rock climbing. Mm-hmm. Um, and but it doesn't have a parachute on it. It's just tied to uh, it's just tied to some webbing that has a carabiner on it's like it's like basically a rope and they just carabine you onto this zip line and then they tell you to jump and you jump out of that tower and you fall about 10 feet maybe or so maybe not quite maybe like six feet Mm -hmm. and then you basically hit the end of that rope and all of that harness goes right up into your crotch and then you then you slide down the zip line and that's your first experience at airborne school jumping out of it (laughs) It's gotcha. it's bizarre. Yeah, I'm not sure that you. Airborne school is three weeks long, and I'm pretty sure that you could learn everything you need to learn in four days. But it's not that hard. You're going to jump out of a plane. You know what I mean? It's not. What what else is it? Gravity does the work for you. Essentially. That is true. That is true. So you've jumped but, out. Um, you jumped out of planes. Jumped out of the tower, and then and then at airborne school you jump out of C-130. So the C-130 is the big cargo plane. Mm-hmm. Um, With it's the not the biggest cargo plane. Back. Like it has see- the hatch door in the back, but you jump out of the side doors. It's the cargo plane that has propellers. Ah, gotcha. Holds it holds sixty four guys. Um, by by the numbers, it holds sixty four guys. I've, oftentimes they'll cram as many as seventy five on there. But <laughs> um, so C one thirties, and then in the eighty second Airborne Division, we jumped out of we had C, we jumped out of C one thirties as well. But the awesome thing about jumping at the eighty second Airborne Division is what they call the mass tactical jump. And I'll tell you what, it it is an experience to behold. It's uh, it's awesome to be a part of one of them, and it's awesome to watch it happen on the ground mm-hmm. because they load up all of the C seventeens that they have probably in the whole state. I would imagine that that they probably get fifteen or twenty C seventeens from all around the state or all around the East Coast to come down to Fort Bragg. They all land. Your the entire battalion gets on. It's on the C-17. Now, the C-17 is basically uh, the upgrade of the C-130. It's bigger than a C-130. Mm-hmm. It's like a it's a it's like a Boeing, I don't know, a Boeing 737 or 747 size aircraft, something like that. Huge. Um, yeah, it's it's huge. They can put like um, I think they can put two or three tanks on there, or oh. four Humvees or something like that. It holds a, it can hold a lot, and it can hold over it can hold a couple of hundred soldiers on there sure um it's big enough you can play basketball in it if it's empty so nuts. so um we get up we, we jumped out of these c-17 so that was like jumping out of a jet and you know it was fun and then of course they're flying 15 of them across the drop zone and people start people are jumping out and you get out in the air and there's just like the sky is just full of paratroopers and oh. it's it was awesome i loved it it's dangerous you could get hurt a lot you know there's of a course. lot of once you jump out, well, this is a static line parachuting, so you, you're jumping from about maybe 900 feet in the air at the most. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah, and the, the parachute is pulled open by your by your static line, which is connected to the cable on the inside of the airplane. So when you jump, your body weight pulls the parachute out for you, and um, you know, and it, it inflates as it comes out, and then you catch that air, and then there's about 2,000 people all falling out of the sky at the same time, all around each other. Cool. And um, how many yeah, collisions? It's crazy. It happens. I've never had one, but it but it happens. Sounds it, like it, it hurts. Happens. Um, I I mean it it can it can be deadly. You know, it's sure. not. It's it's when I say it's a good time, I'm not saying it's play time. It's definitely <laughs> yeah. a very serious business. You got to pay attention and know what you're doing, and you got to be prepared. It's be prepared for the worst, hope for the best type of situation. Sure. Um, but you know, statistically speaking, it's not. You know, it's not something that happens. You know, it's, right? It's that's it's that thing that I heard about happened to somebody once. 
you yeah, know yeah, it's, it's like skydiving then, yeah exactly yeah. exactly maybe probably a little bit yeah, statistically <laughs> Statistically, in terms of accidents, it might be a little bit higher than skydiving. Sure. I, I, I don't know that it's necessarily always more dangerous than skydiving. I think in, in skydiving, if you have a disaster, it's, 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 uh, it's a catastrophe. Yeah, Whereas sure. with, with static line jumping, you can have little accidents and still be okay. You're gonna, you, can be, you can hurt a little bit, but um, right. I, got, I got hurt on a, on a jump one time. It was on the landing, obviously. I banged an elbow on some concrete and, oh. and ended, up, uh, ended up in a sling for a couple of weeks. Um, Did you break anything? I didn't break anything. On, on, no, I, I didn't break anything. Um, the That's only good. bones I've ever broken in my whole body have been my two pinky toes. Oh, really? Yeah. That's fun. But onto the jumping because that's the fun part. I, I jumped out of C C C one thirty C seventeens, and then to get the get get through it, I jumped out of Blackhawk helicopters. I've jumped out of Casas, which is a small propeller type airplane. I've jumped out of I've jumped more than once out of a Huey, believe it or not. Oh yeah. And um, which is the the Vietnam era yeah. combat helicopter. Yeah, I jumped out of Hueys. Um, that was that was an interesting time. Um, but of course. Now we're talking about um, – I also went to – later in my career, I went to Halo school. So I became the military version of skydiving. And um, so by now, you know, once I was jumping out of helicopters and stuff like that, I was jumping out of you – know, I was jumping from 15,000 feet and skydiving basically. Sure. So – but those are all the aircraft I've jumped out. I'm trying to think if I've ever jumped out of anything else besides that. Um, I don't think so. I think that's all of it. That's man. Have you ever done ADR? I have never had to do ADR yet. It's um, terrible. I've done it twice, yeah. and it's so weird because, like, you're watching yourself and then trying to say things exactly as you said while your mouth is saying it, but also give the performance. So, like, if you're doing a big scene in the scene, but you're just, like, in jeans in the recording studio, and if you have to be intense on the screen, you have to be intense in the recording studio, and it's so weird. Like, uh -huh. I did this uh, horror movie short a while back, and in the scene, I'm like, I have a bat and I'm like yelling at someone and I was like, I can't do this without something. I need to hold something. And luckily we did it at the guy's house. So he had the bat still. So in the ADR like booth, I'm holding the bat and like I had to do this whole big thing. It was so weird. It's yeah. Weird. See, I can imagine. I've, I've often wondered about that, about if I ever have to do ADR, does that mean I have to watch the scene and say it exactly yeah. the way my mouth? It I've is. never, I've, I've wondered about that. Great. Yep. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm sure yeah. it'll happen. Prepare. It's a it's a whole separate thing, but uh, you know that's a that's a good that's a good place to go. When did you start acting? Because that's oh, how man. we that's how we met. Yeah. Um. So it was probably about if I remember correctly, it was in 2014. Oh, right on. And um. Well, I mean, so go all the way back to the beginning, just to give myself a little bit more credit. Sure. Um. <laughs> I I tried out for the school play in high school, my senior year. So my senior year, the drama club did a thing and I decided at some point, I decided, Hey, I want to try out this acting thing and see if this is cool. Sure. So I tried out for the play and I got the part of the lead antagonist. Of course. And I had the most lines in the entire play. It was, it was a play <laughs> called, if you want to look this up, it's out there. It's a play called help. I'm trapped in a high school. That's awesome. And, um, yeah, my character was like the principal of the school and he was like, a, he was like a, a maniacal tyrant basically <laughs> and um being all of my experience I, I tried out for the next play and was not selected because i essentially was the same i i thought that it would be the same character and it wasn't sure <laughs> <laughs> so uh my, my hopes and dreams for the future were shattered um and i was i was cursed to a life of learning arabic and jumping out of airplanes that's right but no, okay. So I, I acted in that play. So I had that one experience being in that play, and um, and then I never thought of it again. You know, I became an athlete. I went through college. I went to the military, and that stuff ended up so far away from me that it wasn't even in my, it, it wasn't even on my radar. Sure. And so the thing is, is I have a motorcycle. It's a Honda Valkyrie. I bought it in 1999. I still own it today. It doesn't run right at the moment, but it will soon again, <laughs> hopefully. And um. At the time, it, it, it was running. I moved down here to Tampa from from Fort Bragg and or Fayetteville, North Carolina. I'd moved down here, and a friend of mine had come down here as well and was going to school at the Art Institute in Tampa. Okay. And they have a they have a film program there. And mm -hmm. my friend had become friends with a group of veterans, and some of them were um, some of them were film students. And the guy's name is Dave Mincer. He's the he's the film student that I'm talking about. He was doing a class project. He was doing one of his class projects, which was a film. Um, 
and it was a screenplay. It was original screen. It was a short movie that he had written the screenplay to about veterans who are in a PTSD awareness group, like a therapy group kind of thing. Cool. And um, it's a comedy, so it's you know it's not like this heavy. Even better. It's not he- it's not a heavy PTSD drama story. It's 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 these these four guys are in this therapy session, and it turns into shenanigans, and it's yeah. hilarious. Sweet. So um, so they needed a motorcycle for their first they were doing the first version of this thing and they needed a motorcycle for the scene they were going to do so my friend that i knew that knows dave mincer he called me and said they're doing this and i told him you have a motorcycle he wants to know if he can borrow it so you know veteran to veteran first i was talking to my friend and then Mm -hmm. second veteran to veteran i was like yeah absolutely sure of course i'll do whatever i can to help anybody out so i went down there and brought my motorcycle down to the to the location and it was at an apartment complex they were filming in like the courtyard and i pull up and i meet everybody the director he comes up and he he introduces himself and they're all real nice and um we're waiting there for you know a couple of probably about 45 minutes to an hour and nothing has happened yet and this is my saturday afternoon and i'm thinking how much longer is this going to take you know <laughs> and um he actually came over to me and he said, hey, we're having a problem getting a hold of the actor that was supposed to be here. He's not answering his phone and he hasn't shown up. We don't have any idea where he's at and we don't have a lot of time because they're, 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 the, they're up against the daylight. Yeah. So he says uh, – he asked me, um, are, would you be willing to just do the whole thing? Would you be willing to be the part, do the part? Like you can ride your motorcycle in and then you can play the part. Yeah. And I was just kind of like, um, I mean, I didn't come – I wasn't dressed. I didn't dress right. You know what I mean? I was like, are you sure that you want me to do this? Like I look at the, how I'm dressed. Is this what you want? Like, what are you asking me to do? Like, are you sure? Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't, I don't know. He was asking me to do it. And I was like, uh, I was like, okay, man, if it gets me out of here so I can go home and watch TV, I guess I'll do it. (laughs) So I I did it. I agreed to do it. And I, and I did, it was real easy. I had like two lines and they were, they consisted of one word each probably. Right. And then I banged a guy. I, I slammed a guy on the back of his, leg with a hammer and that was basically sweet. the scene yeah and we were done real quick once we started i think we were done within 30 minutes or so oh sweet and um and i was just like hey cool it was great nice meeting you guys a- awesome good luck in school and everything else or whatever and then i, I took off and i was working at a corporate job at the time at, at freaking 14 hours a day at work so this wasn't anything i was thinking sure. about getting into at all well a couple weeks go by or a couple maybe maybe six or seven weeks goes by and then all of a sudden i get a, a phone call from dave mincer and he's like hey um we uh we're doing a second episode of that same show and i was wondering if you wanted to to be your character again yeah <laughs> so i was like um okay sure so I, like he sent me the screenplay so now i'm now i'm reading the screenplay for the first time and I, and i agree so I, I i agreed to do it and i'll admit i had fun on the first one anyway so i was like yeah sure whatever let's go let's do it yeah so i just kind of got involved with this guy and he he was he, he kept making his student projects and he kept calling me to ask me to play roles in his student projects which was amazing for me. I, I like I, I, I mean, I, I owe that guy so many thank yous, and, and I, I just owe that guy because he, for whatever reason, he just he wanted me to be in his, in his student films. And what happened was, I ended up meeting some people who are real actors that had, you know, in Tampa, people do a lot of independent student film work like that just oh, yeah. to keep themselves busy. And I met some people who were really in the acting circuit. And, um, and one of them, uh, actually, he was there that first day. He's the guy that I hit in the back of the leg with a hammer. His name's Chris Kozlowski. <laughs> and uh, we've, be- we've become very good friends. Um, we talk all the time. He's moved up to Atlanta now, so I don't see him as much. But um, he told me, after working with him several times on, on two different projects, he basically came to me and said, and he, this wasn't in a bad way. It was in a good way. He's like, "There's, a, you need to go over to this place where I've taken classes." And mm-hmm. you need to take these classes because you're 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 good at this, and you need to go, you need to go get like the real training. Sure. So he gave me the information, and then I didn't do anything with it. I'll be honest with you, I did nothing with it. I was like, okay, cool, set it to the side, and on Monday I went to work, mm-hmm. and I never thought about it again. And then fast forward probably two years later, um, I was in Los Angeles. I was working for my, uh, I was out there on a trip on my contracting job. And I was out there with a with another colleague of mine, um, and I won't mention his name, but his background is he was an army officer, and then he worked for the CIA for a while. Uh-huh. And he um, he somehow or another got involved with these consultants that were consulting on a TV show that involved like FBI agents, and he was a consultant. And oh, so when sweet. we 
he was doing that kind of on his own on his own time, and I wasn't aware of it. And so we were having breakfast one morning, and he says, "Hey, I'm going to go up to Hollywood on Thursday and take a, an acting class." Excuse me. He's like, "I'm going to go up to Hollywood on Thursday and take an acting class. Do you want to come with me? Just come with me and check it out." And I was like, "No, <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> no, I don't want to do that. What are you talking about?" And um, so it, it, the conversation was a lot longer than that, but basically, I ended up not going. And but when I came back out to Florida it reminded me of what Chris had said to me. And so I, 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 I called him up and I said, Hey, what was the name of that place again? I want to check it out online. So I went online and started checking it out and decided to decided to go ahead and look into it. Um, and got, you know, I got a, the, the instructor, Yvonne Sahur, she wrote me back almost immediately. Um, and I came over for the first day of class and within the first 30 minutes of the first class that I, had signed up for mm-hmm. i i was that was it really that was yeah i was like oh this is it this is awesome i'm doing this i don't even care what happens i don't I don't care where it goes but i'm i'm finishing this the, like i'm taking this class this is cool yeah just class. and um yeah it was awesome and and her she is an incredible person and all of the instructors that are over there are amazing instructors the school is art's sake it's in orlando and it is it is a, it is i can't even describe it brian it, it's such a warm place and safe place to go and be and just be yourself and be accepted for who you are and and learn how to be a creative individual mm-hmm. without i mean you know without being judged without being screamed out without being being ridiculed i've n- you know, now of course you're you're talking to a guy who was in the army for 12 years. So right. when you talk when you talk about getting yelled at and ridiculed and judged, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I signed up for it for 12. Yeah, years. <laughs> we're on a different level. My 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 tolerance is extremely high. Yeah. <laughs> so, so to me, art's sake is just like it's it, it, it was just I I don't know, man. It was like it was I needed that to happen in my life, and sure. it came it came around at the absolute perfect time. And I went through her whole program, the curriculum. It's a curriculum. A lot of classes that you go to, you just kind of go in and you start doing scene studies or whatever. And, oh, okay. and, and a lot of people are kind of – or at least some of the other places I've checked out, it's like there, there's no beginning. There's no ending. You just kind of show up and you start doing, doing a scene. Right. With Yvonne's courses, there's a curriculum. You, you come in, you sign up, and you go through the first semester, and you, you go through the curriculum. And you, you, if you, you have to pass in order to get into scene studies, which is the next curriculum. And then you go through that curriculum. And then from there, you go into auditions, and you learn how to do auditions. And all of, you have to go through all three of those semesters before you are finished with the courses at, at her studio. Wow. And then – you know, and then after that, then they have the advanced scene studies class, which is just an ongoing. You can come in, you come in, and you just ongoingly work on your craft. Mm-hmm. And um, so, so that really is the story of how it all got started. And of course, like right now, I'm still in the beginning of this anyway. Sure. So it, it, it's still in start phase. And you know, the movie that we worked on together, the the Scoundrels movie. Yeah. The way the way I got that role, it's kind. Of, I'm kind of cheating or a little bit maybe. Um, and I'm not bragging because it's definitely not this easy. I got, I got lucky <laughs> again. I, I've had a couple of lucky dice rolls. What happened was because I know you guys all auditioned for it. You, oh, yeah. you auditioned and waited for like a year and a half. Yeah, to, I was the first person pay. cast. And did you go to an audition or send in a taped audition? Uh, I sent in a tape, and actually, like almost all of the other roles had been recast like two or three times. So, like, right. so like she'd sent me emails like, "This is who's playing this. This is who's playing this." I'm like, "All right, cool." And then nothing for like three or four months. And actually, this is who's playing this. I'm like, "Okay, am I still Gage?" And she's like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're always Gage." I'm like, "All right, cool." That's crazy because <laughs> yeah. I I didn't even know Brittany or know anything about this project. And what happened was. One of the girls in my class at Art's Sake, Lindy, who was on the film yeah, with us. Yeah, Lindy's awesome. She, she is a friend of Brittany's mm-hmm. somehow. I, I don't know exactly how, but I, they, they know each other from somewhere before. And wh- whatever the actor was that was supposed to play Reiko, um, I, I don't know what happened. But I got a phone call from Lindy saying – or a text from Lindy saying, would you be interested in playing someone in <laughs> a Star Wars fan film? 
And I was like, of course, I would be interested in doing anything. <laughs> I'm an actor who, who has never been in a movie before. That's right. <laughs> I, have a, I, I have a standard that I, that I will always be above. We don't need to talk about that. That's right. But, I, it, you know, if it's if it's acting in whatever pro- – I mean, I already, I already did Dave Mincer's student films. What, how worse could it get? <laughs> um, and his films weren't bad. I'm not saying that they were bad at all. I'm just saying, you know, like when we're talking about would I act in a movie, I don't, you don't even have to ask that. Just call me. Right. Um. That's the stage we're at, right? So she calls me, and I, I said, absolutely, sure. So um, that's how I got into it. Basically, Lindy, Lindy was basically solving a problem for Brittany by, by getting someone that she knew to come in and, and do it. So I, I got the screenplay, I think, about three weeks before we shot and oh came in, yeah, and, and we did it, and it was awesome. So I, I got to skip all of the weight and suspense. And <laughs> Lucky. I'm just glad I, I made it. <laughs> it's, it. It's interesting how like I've actually talked to people – who told me that they are they they auditioned for that movie? They're like, oh, I auditioned really? for that, and I was like, you did. That's oh, funny. you don't want to know how I got the job. Yeah, I know. <laughs> See, I like. I just got lucky. Somebody like Brittany, I guess, posted a. Uh, uh, she was looking for people who had like movie quality alien masks on Twitter, and somebody oh. I knew saw the listing and messaged me because I had one. And sure. I was, like, I was like, yeah. I was like, hey, I've got this, and Brittany's like, can I get some pictures of it? I was like, sure, and I sent them in. And then I was like, you know, I'm, I'm an actor. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for it. And I was like, hey, also, I've been in this. I've done these two movies before. I've been in a feature, all this stuff. And I just like sent her my resume. And she goes, oh, well, you know, if you want, you can audition for this role. And I'm like, sure. And I made a tape and did the whole thing. And then yeah, I got cast through that. But it was because I had That's an cool. alien mask that got me in the door. What was what, which alien was it? Uh, the nine numb one, the Celestin. I have no idea what that he is. Was, dude. Remember the guy who couldn't see anything? He was sitting at the table. Oh with yeah, a vest. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we're like, yes. Is he okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's my mask. <laughs> that poor guy. I know. That was hilarious. What a okay. trooper. So he's the guy that's in the Return of the Jedi movie with Lando that's in the Falcon. The one. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, that was awesome. Yep. So through that, I didn't know that was yours because you know the, the other there was another guy on that film, Nick. Um, yep. he, he played the uh, he played the guy from the can he played like the hog nose creature or whatever that was. Yeah, the orc mask um, guy. And uh, yeah, he, that that guy's work is phenomenal. That it guy, is. he does such amazing. Do you follow his Instagram? I do. He's oh my incredible. god. And he just it's does insane. it for fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's insane. But he had a couple of other. He had like the Greedo mask, and he had all those other masks. So that's great. cool. I didn't realize that that other one was yours. Yeah, it was a fun movie. I will tell you what, what what a uh, it was an experience because it was a shotgun. It was a shotgun shoot. Like it was the whole the whole movie was filmed in one in one weekend. <laughs> weekend yeah. And um, did we break in the middle? We did, right? Uh, I yeah, mean, we did. For, we did. For like we dinner. We, <laughs> No, we we went and slept and then came back the next day. Yes, yes, but then okay. the, the yeah. second so day we days. pulled like a twenty hour day. Yeah, it was insane. Yeah, I know. I got done. We started at like one in the afternoon, and I was done at seven a.m. And you guys were still going. Yep, yep. And then I drove back to Naples. Oh my god, that was bonkers being Dimitri. But that was super crazy. fun. So I've I've never taken an acting class before. So what? Really? Yeah. And so like, what's the what's like something big that you've learned taking classes? Give me some free oh. info, Josh. <laughs> oh my god! Um, <clears throat> first of all, why haven't you taken acting classes? You know, that's a good question. I'm new to this acting stuff, and uh, I when I looked around where I'm at in Naples, there is not a whole lot. Yeah. So I'd have to drive at least two hours. And well, I see, look, I, I have to drive to Orlando every weekend to go to Art's sake. It's two hours from Tampa to Orlando, so I know the pain, man. I, and it's, I mean, that, I, that's I wouldn't that's, mind how, as much. that's how that's how awesome that that's how awesome it is there i, I, I don't hesitate great. to drive all that way to go do it it sounds great. Um, my big thing is i work every single night and mm. that's like the biggest downside so i work from like midnight to say six and by doing that i'm like all right i'm gonna be half asleep for something let's do this what do you what do you do at work what's your job i deliver bulk orders of newspapers to stores oh okay, okay. yeah yeah so that kind all of right so you have like this bit. you have like the night shift yep Seven nights a week, three sixty five, son. So, um, oh wow, seven nights a week. Seven nights a week. Jeez, dude. I know. You're you, so like. There's this problem with actors, um, having to stay dedicated to their passion while also having something to eat in the refrigerator. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, you're you're up against. You're you're not going the easiest route. I can tell you that. That's right. So for a better what, story. Have I, what have I learned in? And yeah, we all have our struggles, definitely. That's right. Um, Hey, at least you don't have to jump out of airplanes yeah. to, to figure out what you want to do. <laughs> That's right. 
So anyway, um, something big I've learned at acting school, you know, probably there's a lot of stuff that I could pontificate about acting wise. I'm going to tell you this. The biggest thing is don't judge yourself. Ooh. That's probably one of the most important things that you learn at a, at a quality acting program is not to judge yourself. Um, I've been on some films. You seem like, like, like your, your personality is just kind of, you've got a great sense of humor and you're kind of like, eh. Go on. Go <laughs> yeah, on. exactly. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I don't know, dude. I'm not the, the, the best spoken when it comes to, you know, I'm not the most chatty guy when it comes to interpersonal stuff. I don't know, but you're just, <laughs> you're, 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 you've got a great sense of humor and you're, you're sort of like, you've got you i don't know if it's thick skin or if it's just you have a, you, you you've got uh, you've got like a sloped shoulder you know what i mean like i don't see that a lot of stuff really bothers you you know that what i mean you true. didn't see that that's kind of what i'm getting at like, like brian sat brian sat across the table and never even led on that anything felt pressure or that it was bothering him or that his performance might not have been what people needed or whatever which in your case i think that worked out great for you just be warned that in the future you might want to be able to – if somebody does need something from you uh, in terms of uh, acting a role, you have to kind of understand the language to be able to of know course. what they're talking about. But that's – you know, whatever. That's, that's, for, that's for acting school. Yeah. <laughs> so um, – but um, yeah, not judging yourself. So you didn't do it, but I'll tell you this. I, I, I've been on some other films recently and been wor- – and worked with some people who are not actors and – they're playing main roles in in an independent film and they've never even been never been an actor never been to an acting class and never acted in anything ever before ah. and on the set um and this is a little bit of a higher stakes project this is one that had some some backing with funding uh, there was there was a uh, um there was some production value to it and so people were kind of like hey we really we want to make sure this is going well sure and so you know, I I got to be there and sort of step out of the actor, the acting role for a couple of moments and help some guys with with things that they could do to try to make what they were doing a little bit more natural. Right. Um. And so you kind of become a little bit more of like a director at that moment, and so you got to be real. You got to be really careful how you do it because people can be people's feelings can get hurt and and they can feel, um, they can feel like you're criticizing them and you're you're not, um. In this case, luckily, everybody had some. Everybody was open to that type of advice, and so I was helping them. But then afterwards, just talking to them, you could tell that they they were just they were not sure. That's the thing. Is that's the thing. Is it comes across as I'm not sure that what I did. I'm not sure about what I did. I don't know if I did that. I don't know if I did that. Sure. You know, and and here's the thing. Like, you can't be judging yourself, man. First of all, you're not an actor. You haven't ever been to acting school, and this is the first time you've acted. So whether or not it's what you expected or not, like don't beat yourself up about it because you're you're achieving something that many people try their entire life to do and never can figure out how to get it done. And you're just getting it done. So first of all, like like you have everything to be happy about. Don't judge yourself. This is this is what I was telling telling them, you know, but you can't judge yourself, man, because because if you judge yourself, it forces you into a way of thinking through your performance. And with acting for film, you don't want to be thinking about what you're doing. You don't think about I'm going to perform the role this way and think about it. It has sure. to be more. It has to be more instinctual. Um, it has to be more what they call organic. I guess is the best right. word. It's got to be use. real. Well, yeah, it has, to, it has to be living truthfully under imaginary circumstances. You have mm. to be able to live it truthfully. And if you start judging yourself, the next thing you do is you start directing yourself inside of the character. And when you direct yourself, that's not organic. Right. Um, and it, it can come across – that's how things start to come across very tense and shut down. And so the more you judge yourself and the more, the more you direct yourself, the actual less – the less truthfully you're living on screen. And that's what translates across to the audience, and people can see that, and, and just and, and, and you know they'll they'll notice that this is not good. You sure. know, that's what people will say. This isn't good acting. It's right. not good. <laughs> there, there's no such thing as bad acting. There really isn't. It, it, that's that's one of the. There's another lesson for you, actually. Another big lesson. There is no such thing as bad acting. The acting is it either it, it, it is it is what it is. It either is or it isn't what was intended. 
Oh. So it's it's not it's not that it's good or bad. No acting is great. No acting is terrible. It just is. It is what what it is. And so the tools that you use in it as an actor, um, that you get from going to the studio and studying with other actors and with professors who have a lot of experience and know what they're doing, you learn the tools that are necessary to be able to stay in the truthful moment as an actor in the scene that you're doing. Right. And so, so you, you can't, as an actor, you don't think of yourself in terms of good or bad, which is judgmental. You don't judge yourself. Right. You Ah. just, you just look at the, you you look at what you're supposed to do. You know, you read the screenplay, you, you, you get on set with the actors and the director, and then you go into the toolbox that you have built up for yourself at school. And you just, do things truthfully. And I know it sounds kind of esoteric and, and it, it like kind of is. I, I don't even really know how to explain it better than that. No, you, um, you explained it perfectly. I love that. It's like one of those things where, you know, when you hear the right thing, the light bulb goes off and just two plus two makes sense. That That's, what, that's what that was. I've never heard that before. Good. That's amazing. That's, and I think that's really important as well to not judge yourself because then you're not in it. Like I, right. the, the, exactly. the one of the, I did, I did a lead in the feature film a few years back and one of the other leads was also the writer and the director. And that right. was something that I had a, a hard time with in some of our scenes together was because he was thinking about the scene and the shot. So he wasn't there in the scene with me and Precisely. I couldn't put it on. I couldn't make sense of it until just now. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, exactly. I like that. Yeah. So there, so there are, there are, there are exercises that you learn, you know, it's almost like, um, it's, it's almost in a similar, it's a similar way, almost like being on a football team. I'll be honest with you. You know, you, you do exercise on football practice is nothing but a bunch of exercises that you do, (laughs) you know, well you go to, you go to the acting studio and it's, it's exercises except for it's, it's drama exercises and you're, you're, it's eye contact. It's talking to people. It's, um, it's learning how to, um, I don't want to use the word focus because that would be <laughs> that would that would imply that your concentration is not on the other actor. Right. Uh, the only thing that you're supposed to pay attention to that like the main the 90 percent of what you're supposed to be paying attention to when you're acting in film is the other actor. You just pay, you pay attention to what the other actor is doing and they should be paying attention to you. Sure. And that's it. Like, like it's it's eye contact and it's it, it is focus on the partner. That's that's the name of the game. Sure. And so it's exercises that you do to help you learn how, how how you're supposed to do that. You know, there's some technique stuff, you know, like you talk about pacing and comedic acting and improv and stuff like that. But, you know, those those are just little those are little things you put in the toolbox. But but all, all it is, is eventually it's channeling all that stuff into a give and take between you and whoever your partner is. And I know you know what that's about because you sat directly across the table <laughs> from me. I was and just we had about that, to say that. Yeah, we had that scene. We had that. We, part of that scene is an exchange between you and me, which is <laughs> I had such a great time filming that Same. scene with you. And um, and that give and take is back is back and forth. And I I can right now I remember the two of us gazing into each other's eyes like a couple of star-crossed lovers. Yeah, <laughs> I mean <laughs> that's what I got from the scene. <laughs> that's what that's what I took away from it too. We were just in a, it was just a lover spat. That's right. A- after the after the film, we 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 went out we out, went out back behind the garage and and we made up we made up. We did we did it was beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> that's beautiful moment. that's yeah. funny because uh, I was just about to say I was like you're making me feel really good right now because what you're saying is what we did. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was it was totally. You're like, you're like you got to be yeah. in the scene and eye contact. I was like wow the entire shoot was just me and you. <laughs> Not breaking eye contact. Precisely, yeah, that because you, because I was supposed to be trying to kill you, and you were basically sitting there with this look on your face, like "Go ahead and kill me." That's right. <laughs> I see your. Guess knife. what I've got? Guess what I have in my pocket? That's right. And I raise you a thermal detonator. That <laughs> <laughs> was great. Yeah. All right. Spoiler alert! Don't. Yeah. Spoiler alert. It's How a... many days we got? I'm so anxious to see this thing. You I, and it, me both. It's killing me. It is today. We're recording this on Monday, April 30th. Yeah. The short comes out Friday. So we're like, so it's coming out this coming Friday. This coming Friday, May fourth. Oh, okay. I'm so pumped. I am too. So I, so I can, I can, chill out and be happy about the fact that it's one week. Exactly, less than. What one week is better than six days or whatever it is. Exactly, or a year and a half. <laughs> right. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm I'm stoked to see it, um, and um, yeah, it's I think it's going to be great. 
Me too. Me too. It's gonna be great. I'm gonna have Brittany on after it comes out so she can get into the nitty gritty of that. But uh, yeah. yeah. You know, we haven't even talked about why you asked me to be on this show in the first place. Welcome to my show, Josh. <laughs> Thank you. Because I'll, I'll give the show gonna... back over to you now. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for uh, allowing me on the Josh Russell podcast. <laughs> Brian, Brian, you are welcome. I'm so happy to have you on the Brian Balance uh, podcast. You I, did a very good job on your own pen. Thank you, thank pod. you. You as well. You know, I wasn't sure how I was going to go. That's it's a big name to live up to, but uh, I, I think we did it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we did. So as long as we have okay. each other in the scenes of life, Josh, I think we can we can make it through. I guess that's true. You know, I, I won't I won't Not give spoilers, sure that but I'll, I'll I won't give spoilers, but I'll say that there's a stunt in this short that you carried me through. So, <laughs> oh, that is it, literally true. I it's good, it's right? It's good. True. Oh god, it's gonna be so funny. I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. So, the knife. The the, the knife. The, remember the, the 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 gag we did with the knife. Oh yeah, it's gonna people. It's gonna be so people cool. are gonna love it. So, it's gonna be so. On cool. the, You're on listening. That, how, how, is, is it? How, how many people are listening to this? Is there uh, any way to know that? Uh, there will be after it comes out. Oh okay. Well, good, I don't want you to. A, a I, I don't. Chunk. I don't know what. It's, <laughs> Good, cool. So a good chunk of people yeah. go, wh- whatever you're doing, I don't know what else you do, but pay attention to what we're talking about and go onto YouTube yes. and look up the channel, the the Big City Send Out. It's a YouTube channel run by director, producer, Brittany Joyner. It is. And great. this is, this is going to be a, I, what, do, how long is it? Is it about a 15 minute long film? I think it's definitely 15 or less. Okay, so yeah. we're talking about a, it's about fifteen minutes long, roughly. Yep. And it's a Star Wars fan film, and and this is what I will tell you about it. We shot this movie in two days. We did. And we shot the whole thing inside of a one car garage. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and I'm telling you, it, like it, it. I mean, it, I'm not trying to ruin it, but I mean, if you look real close, you might see something. But I'll be shocked if it doesn't look like what it's intended to look like. It's gonna be. It's going to be one of the it's going to be one of the coolest fan films that I think has has ever come out. And I've I've looked on YouTube. I know there's some Star Wars fan films on YouTube. One of them's in Italian actually, and it's oh, like yeah. over an hour long. Have you seen that one? Oh, I've seen them all. <laughs> yeah, I should imagine you have. You're more of a nerd about this than I am, which Thank is you. fascinating. By the way, um, that in and of itself is kind of a, a, a sticking point for me because I have been a Okay, so my Star Wars fandom goes all the way back to 1976 when the first movie came out. Because uh-huh. I saw I saw the original Star Wars movie in the theaters when it was in theaters. My dad uh-huh. just my, and and furthermore, it is the first that is the first movie that I saw that wasn't a Disney cartoon. Oh, what? That's awesome. Yeah, exactly. So I I sat peeled my eyes. Of course, I don't remember it, but my dad tells me the story. He laughs at me because I'm such a Star Wars enthusiast. Oh yeah. And um, he said that my eyes never blinked. He's like, we would go to the 101 Dalmatians and Cinderella and all that kind of stuff, and you'd be asleep in 30 minutes. We went to <laughs> Star Wars, and you you never blinked. You didn't blink during the whole movie. And um, then a couple of weeks went by. Because this was when we lived in Moab, by the way, and we had to drive all the way to Grand Junction, Colorado, to to go see the movie. Nice. And then a couple of weeks went by, and it finally came to the drive-in theater at Moab. And my dad, <laughs> we, I liked the movie so much that my dad was like, "We got to take Josh to go see Star Wars again." And yes. we brought a friend. We brought one of my friends with me. I think I was probably five years old or something like that. I may have been four years old at the time. Mm-hmm. And um, did it come out in seventy-six or seventy-eight? Seventy-seven. Okay, there you go. So it came out in 77. That's why I was born in 74. So it came out in in 77. So I was just I had just turned four. Mm -hmm. And um, by the time we we were at the drive in theater, we were in 78. Sure. Back back in those days, dude, movies were in theaters for like six months. Oh, yeah. The the original played for over a year. It was nuts. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Exactly. So, like, I'm sure the Avengers movie will be in theaters for two and a half weeks. In, <laughs> in, 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 for real. Mind boggling. So, I just still haven't seen it yet. I still haven't. I, I haven't it's seen. So good. I haven't even seen Black Panther yet. I, I missed it in the also, theater. So, so idiot. good. Don't. I'll see it. Don't say anything else. <laughs> um, so, uh, but anyway, blah blah blah. We go to the th- we go to the drive-in theater with my friend, and it had been weeks, probably months, since I saw it in the theaters. I was four and had only seen it one time. And it was the first movie I'd ever gone to. And my dad said I wouldn't stop reciting the lines. He's like, er, like you were you were reciting the movie on the second time through. Dude, so, yes. Yeah, I was I, I, like Star Wars. Star Wars was my life growing up as Same. a kid. That's what I was. I was I was Han Solo 
every yes. day. Yes. I get out of school in kindergarten. We would get out of class, and I would go down to the swing set with my friend Steve Robinson, and we'd get on the swing sets together, and we would play Star Wars, and we would go back and forth between one of us being the Millennium Falcon and the other one being a TIE fighter. Yes. And we, we would get swinging back and forth, and then as we passed each other, we would reach out and kick each other. <laughs> and that was like the Star Wars spaceship battle. It was insane. Like, we were Star Wars. We were insane. So anyway, but the thing, my point is, like, you know more about Star Wars trivia than anyone I've ever met. Like, the names <laughs> of all these aliens and all this stuff. I'm like, dude, what? What Thank is that? You. Thank you. <laughs> oh, it's that guy in the Millennium Falcon. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes. Yeah, so so, <laughs> so you are, like, on a whole nother level of of enthusiastic about Star Wars stuff. And, I, by the way, I, like, I won't, go do, I won't go down the road of the, of the prequels. <laughs> but, um... But I'm, I, I've been extremely happy with everything that they've done with the sequels. The, the Adam Driver, by the way, I, I, Adam Driver is fantastic. I, I the, love they him in cast, they, Me too. I thought he was – he stole the movie. In, he was in amazing. Eight. Absolutely fantastic performance by him. They cast him perfectly for that role. He's, he's amazing. Agreed. Um, can't wait for Solo to come out, and I – I cannot wait for Scoundrels to come out. It's going to be fun. So, uh, yeah, bringing it back around for the plug. Bringing it, <laughs> bringing it back around. Get out there and get get on YouTube and check it out. Get on my my Instagram page. It's Josh D Russell. I'm plugging it every day, so you, can, so you can find the link on my Instagram page. Um, Brian is plugging it as well. Yeah. Um, so get up there and, and and watch a watch a Star Wars fan film and support independent film. Yeah, that is the perfect note to go on. I didn't even have to ask where people can find you online. Josh, you know what? This is why you have a podcast and I'm your guest. Thank you. I love Thank it. You. I love exactly. it. That was great. So yeah. next week we'll be talking to uh, – <laughs> Just muffle it. Next week on – we're going to be talking to – and it's going to be great. <laughs> awesome. I'm a professional. Anyway. Oh, you know what? Hold on. Before we go, this is going to be episode 55. Oh, uh, here we go. And I thought of you because number five is your number. Number five is my number. Talk and the next, the next, okay, there we go. Fair <laughs> enough. You don't even have to ask the question. Yeah, yep. number five. So I've got a tattoo on my left shoulder mm-hmm. that is the number five. It's just a number five tattoo. And I get asked all the time, why do you have this tattoo? Um, and the the answer is kind of... It, it, it's goofy, man. I'll be honest with you. Why, why is number five my number? So the number 55 comes from in high school. Um, you know, I, I, was a, I was a high school football player. My senior year was uh, an, an especially special year for us. Um, we had a group of seniors on my high school team that had been together for since middle school. And there must have been 20 to 25 of us. Then we had been all on the same team together since middle school. So by our senior year, we just had this cohesive unit, and it was like the it was like the best cl- boys' club that you could have ever asked to be in. It was a, a, just an awesome experience. And my number, my jersey number, was fifty five. Oh. And so that's why fifty five. So it's really just the the number fifty five is about the memory of just the the amazing senior year of football that that we had we went on and we won, we won the district championship that year in my this is when we were in New Mexico now so we're we're in Moriarty New Mexico mm-hmm. the Pintos the Moriarty Pintos Ooh-hoo. was our mascot and um we went on to win the district championship which was unheard of for us as, as like we were the team that everybody beat up on for years and years <laughs> and years and then my senior year we came out as a powerhouse and we and we were a contender we went to the state playoffs and then we won in the quarterfinals so we we won our first playoff game for the state championship but then we actually lost in the semifinals but the good news is is that we lost to a super power team um and the team, the team that we lost to was Roswell Goddard. And so that's Roswell, New Mexico, the, the famous Roswell, New Mexico of the alien oh, crash yes. or whatever. Well, that's in an area of New Mexico that is actually more similar to West Texas than it is anything else. Mm. And so football, in what, if you know anything about football, uh-huh. West Texas football is like, I mean, West Texas football, you can't contend with it. Like yeah. West Te- that's Odessa Permian. Um, Friday night lights. That's the type of, that's, that's the attitude of high school football. High school football in West Texas is sometimes bigger than college in, or, or the NFL. Yeah. And so Roswell is an Eastern New Mexico football team and their, their, their football program is more like a West Texas football program. They got a lot of money, huge boosters, all of the 
biggest athletes. And so like when we went down there to play against them in the playoffs, we were up. It was like going up against a division two college team almost like yeah. we were outsized. We were outrun. We were just outplayed. They beat the shit out of us <laughs> and they did it fair and square, man. And it was so we lost in the semifinals, but we lost to a super big powerhouse team. And that team went on to win the state championship. And um, that makes it better. It definitely does. It does. And then the next year, that team went up a division and played in a different they, – they went up into a, diff, a different uh, – what do they call it? It's AAA, quad A. Uh-huh. Um, so we were a AAA team. They went up to 4A the next year. So the next year, they weren't even in the AAA division. <laughs> so we did – we just had a really good year, and it was, it was awesome. And our theme song – for us in the locker room before we went out to play was queen we will rock you so every er, in the locker room before every game right before we ran out and took the field we would listen to we will rock you of course and then um we went out and we played and that was in 1991 we went out and we 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 had an undefeated season with a district championship won won the state quarterfinals lost in the semifinals and so that was 1991 and we ran out on the field to play the semifinals, and we lost. It was a battle. I'm telling you, they didn't just walk all over us. We we gave them a run for it, but in the end, they beat us. Mm-hmm. And then we came into the locker room defeated and and done. And you know, you know, everybody thinks that's the last time they're going to play football. Yeah. And so it's crying. I mean, it's it's a disaster. You're in there. You know, one locker room is doing backflips and and super high on, on life and the other team has just had their whole life crushed and their life dream crushed and you're never going to have an opportunity to do this again sure. so we we were we were the locker room where everybody was taking their pads off and, and crying and hugging and um and guys were sad and the thing is this is such a weird ironic fact <laughs> is that during the game it was during the game itself freddie mercury passed away oh wow yeah, and so it was like when we came into the locker room, they came in and, and, and people told us, hey, did you guys know that that Freddie Mercury has passed away t- today? And it was just like, oh, no. what a weird Salt sort of wound. thing. Yeah, <laughs> just a, well, it was just kind of like, to me, I don't know if anybody else thought of, thought of it, but to me it kind of was like chills down my back. It's like, wow, that was almost like it was meant to happen. Yeah. So in a weird in a weird way, I don't know. But anyway, is it just an interesting thing. So anyway, that's number 55. 55 is my jersey number. Number five is just kind of I'm not I'm not really I don't really believe in numerology. I think numerology is a bunch of hokey kind of weirdo stuff. It's just kind of like <laughs> yeah, number, you know, numbers are just numbers, dude. They there's no meaning in them. Uh-huh. You know, you, you add up the amount of numbers in your name and then you add them together and then you divide them by the numbers in your name and that's how you get to your like what? Right. <laughs> that that means that you know, it doesn't right. mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. It's, it's not that at all. Sure. But but there are there are numbers that Numbers are used as symbols, and there are some things about the number five that symbolically, not not new, not not numerology symbolism. Well, some of the some of the symbolism in numerology is kind of cool to look at. Sure. Um, but there are other there are other things that the number five represents that um, that are just kind of. If you go back over my life, you know, I've I've had some I've had a lot of trials, and I've had some things that are pretty tough to deal with, and so the number five is just kind of um, – it's, symbol- it's, it's symbolic meaning in different sorts of ways. Mm-hmm. Just kind of has a, a special meaning to me. It just kind of reminds me, you know, um, it just kind of reminds me to, to, to stick it out and overcome and, and stay true to yourself and, you know, redemption and stuff like that. I'm into and it. So it's, it just has a yeah. That's that's all it is. It's just a personal little meaning kind of. It's just one of those little things that I can kind of always think about to just sort of, you know, stay sane. I guess I don't know. Num- numbers don't keep me sane. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about, Brian. <laughs> I'm just trying to tell you that when I see a number five, I go. And now here's the thing: I watch TV shows like um like I've late, recently I've been watching Jessica Jones mm-hmm. um, on Netflix and. I've seen the number five pop up on screen in these. Uh, that's that's what happens. Like it's like um, the apartment that's the apartment that she goes into that's down the off down from her office. Mm-hmm. The apartment is apartment number five. And you're like, and so Ooh. yeah, you know, and I see it every, but I see it all over the place. I'm like, well, it's it's the number five. It's the number five. If you watch Deadpool, um, oh, yeah. in the first Deadpool movie. Um, there is at the end of the movie, they're on the, like the crashed thing from the Avengers movie, like whatever that flying platform thing yeah, yeah. is talking about. 
Well, if you look at it, that the number of that ship is it's like number five. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah, so it's everywhere, and I just see it, and I'm like, oh, it's 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 number five. It's my number. It's where it's at. You know, it's where it's at. I'm into and, it. Um, so that's that's it. I don't even know if it means I can't explain it any better than that. I'm an idiot. It's, I'm a weird. <laughs> I'm a nerd. I don't know. It's just hey, my thing. I'm. You know what? I'm glad I could have you on this to ease you, Josh, because my number is the number two. It is. I love the number two. I have a keychain. It's a. It's literally just a leather tag with a number two on it. I've cool. always loved two. Like my initials, Brian Balance, second letter of the alphabet. My initials are two B's. <laughs> Look at I, that. I'm with you. I. You know what? Kindred spirits, man. You know. Oh. oh. I don't have the number. I don't have a letter that starts with my number. That's right. <laughs> That's why it's bullshit, right? It's just all, <laughs> yeah. it's all a bunch of horseshit. Dude. I came in here to tell you that I like numbers. <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> so you like Star Wars. I like Star Wars. You love numbers. I love numbers. Let's be dude, friends, Josh. Yeah, we should be friends. I think what it means is we need to make another movie together, Brian. I, I agree. That's what it sounds like I'm to winking. me. And I'm winking. To get, that, to get that done, we've got to get your career path on track with something other than delivering papers. Tell me about but, it. But let's we can work on that. I yeah, think we can work on. That. We'll get there. We'll get there. You, you really you need you got you got to find something to d- that you can do that will allow that will support you being able to do what you want to do. You're right. You're so right. I'm working on it. It'll be great. Remind people where can they find you online? Working what online? Where can they find you online? I'm from North where Carolina. They, they fi- I don't know. Where can <laughs> where can they find me online? I have the best place to track me down right now is Instagram. Sweet. Um, my Instagram feed is at Aspirand. Uh, Josh D. Russell, all one word, no periods or any of that. And um, there's a nice – my, my, my picture has got a white background, and I have long hair and a beard and a red shirt. You'll, you'll spot me. He looks majestic. Uh, I, yeah, I do. I kind of look, <laughs> look kind of in a redneck sort of way. That's right. I'm into it. So this was great. Thank you again for coming on. This was super Thanks fun. Thanks for having me, dude. It was. It was very cool. It was great. It was great to talk to you again. It's been a while. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Scoundrels this Friday. Scoundrels is Friday. I think we're doing sort of like a group online premiere where we're all going to log in and, and have like a, 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 a virtual glass of champagne and then watch the movie together or something like that. Sweet. Have you heard about that? No? I've heard I've heard whispers. Okay, great. Then I'll then I'll see you Friday. Yeah, see you Friday. Awesome, dude. Awesome. Yeah. Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of uh, The Interesting Podcast. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Jedi Brian. If you want to follow the show, it's at Pot of Interest on Twitter. And uh, if you enjoyed this, uh, if you wouldn't mind, go to iTunes and give it a five-star rating. That pushes us to the front of uh, the iTunes algorithm, and it helps book guests. Um, yeah, so I really appreciate you listening. Until next time, be well.